this would be the start of mm. our podcast adventure because we both really like yeah. true crime. So welcome to No Effing Clue. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay. No Effing Clue. Okay. So we're not your average true crime podcast. Uh, so here we will talk about um, true crime. We'll talk about paranormal stuff, conspiracy theories. I can't talk. Um all of the weird mysteries that surround the earth. So, Voodoo wanted us to talk about H.H. H. Holmes at one point, and I did. I did extensive research because I really thought did. I thought that I knew everything that I had to know about H.H. H. Holmes, but boy, was I wrong boy, as fuck! Wrong. There's so much yeah. information out there. You want this on a (laughs) (laughs) t-shirt? So, so when when Voodoo said, hey, let's let's talk about H.H. Holmes, I was like, Murder Castle, got it. And it's so much more than Murder Castle. It's so much. It's... Like, and, and because this happened so long ago, like the late 1800s, you know, the 19th, late, you know, 19th century, basically, um, a, lot of, a lot of this has been mythologized, and there's been a lot of added to it. People have different theories, and so it's a lot of, it's a, it's a lot of really interesting stuff that you read that whether or not it's true, um, it's just ridiculous. Like, uh, I, I, yeah, I, it, it's kind of a, a very interesting he was an interesting guy, that's for sure. Interesting, to say the least. He was kind of grody. He was what? so gross. So yeah, gross. Yeah, and he was, he was a real, like, fraudster, too. Like, I... We, we a know him scam for, artist. Yeah, we, we know him for the people he killed, but he, he, like, committed insurance fraud, and a lot of the people he committed fraud against, when they'd find out, he, he, I think he'd end up killing them, right? Yeah. yeah Mis misremembering that? No, no, yeah, he would he would find a way to kill him. It's wild. <laughs> so, H. H. Holmes was born Herbin Webster Mudgett on May sixteenth, eighteen sixty one. So that's very close to my birthday. He's a Taurus. Um, he was born in New Hampshire to Levi Mudgett and Theodate Page Price. I love that name. That's such a great name. <laughs> Theodate. You don't see names like that anymore, do no. you? No. Theodate. So, I'm not going to lie. If I ever have a daughter, I kind of want to name her Theodate. I think it's so cool. <laughs> you, could, you could shorten it to, like, Theo if you wanted yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he was born into a wealthy family um, and showed signs of intelligence at an early age. Um, his father was a farmer who was described as a violent alcoholic that would beat his children and lock them in the attic when they misbehaved. And his mother was a former school teacher described as a cold and distant individual who used religion as a parenting guide. Interesting. It's, uh, it's always, it, when you come back to all of these disturbed individuals, it's always like the mom or the dad was exceptionally cruel, um, either like, mentally abused them, physically abused them, like, lock, locked him in the attic. Like, I'm, I'm tired of dealing with you. Get in the attic. Yeah, that was, that was the most wild thing. Just in the first couple of hours of just doing all this research, that was the one thing that I was just like, wow, really? What the hell? In the attic? I don't, it's so wild to me. Oh, so they were described as a devout Methodist um, family with uh, strict disciplinarians and upright, God-fearing citizens. Uh, Herman spent a lot of time reading Edgar Allan Poe, Jules Verne, and he also developed a love for schemes and inventions, which we'll get into a little bit later. This man was wild. He was a troublemaker for sure. 
uh, kids in school thought that he was awkward and quiet. Uh, he was often bullied. Many of us were probably often bullied. So I feel I, like that's a prerequisite for school. Yeah. You're going to get bullied. That <laughs> definitely is true for all people, I think. Uh, he had a fear of the local doctor, and he was forced to... Now, this part here, I found varying um, things on... Um, so he was forced to sit in a room and stare at a skeleton. So I heard that he was locked in a closet, um, and forced what? to stare at a skeleton by his schoolmates or the doctor tried to cure him of this fear. Like, like with exposure therapy? Like, yeah. Hey, you know, he's really scared of the doctor. So we're going to, we're going to make him stare at a skeleton. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's not healthy. Nope. That's uh, but he pushed through this fear and he found a love of the medical profession and he would soon begin trapping animals and performing surgeries on them. Now we all know when you hear animals and torture of animals, it all starts with the animals, right? Right. It's, um. Uh... With a lot of the serial killers and violent people, it's like a natural progression. Like they yeah. start testing out their desires on animals. Yeah, it's wild. And then the next one goes to people. You know? So that's a pretty common theme. Yeah. Uh, Bestie f said, if you think that's crazy, you should watch the movie Flowers in the Attic. I've seen that one. That one's wild. I have not. Is that uh, V.C. Andrews, right? I want to say it's V.C. Andrews. Um, some accounts suggest that he may have killed a childhood friend named Tom. Now, Tom, uh, he allegedly fell off of an old abandoned house that they were both exploring, um, like off the, the balcony. Mm -hmm. um, but others believe that he was close enough, like Herman was close enough to have pushed him off of the balcony and killed him. So is, that's fun. Is, any, I, is it just a rumor? Did they uh, ever find yeah, evidence? Yeah, we don't know. Um, I didn't find anything verifying or denying any of that. So, although later on he did, I don't think I have this written anywhere in here, but later on he did say that he killed one of his former classmates. Um, but his former classmate did actually die in Canada, so we're there's a lot going on, a lot to unpack with this man. <sighs> Continue. Yes. Uh, so at 16, he graduated school and married a woman named Clara Loverly in 1878. Clara, dear sweet Clara. She didn't know. She had no idea. Uh, Clara followed... Herman to the University of Vermont where she paid for his schooling and once she ran out of funds um, her father paid his way so oh, so young young Herman found himself a, a sugar mama basically exactly <laughs> in 19th century that's wild yeah Ugh. imagine <laughs> hey dad I ran out of money can you pay for my uh Boyfriend's <laughs> school. Oh gosh, and not too, uh, not too later after that, he, uh, they actually had a baby. They had a son named uh, Robert. Um, so, yeah, his name was Robert, and Herman left Clara and Robert in Vermont in 1882. So he, this, their son was two years old when he left them in Vermont. So he, w he ended up going to the University of Michigan for medical studies after leaving. I, it was there he began grave robbing and selling the bodies to the school janitor. Now, now that was usually the janitor's job was to obtain the cadavers so that oh. they can, yeah, so that they could uh, use them in their studies. So they had to find somebody to get it. I was I was wondering is, why the janitor like like all right let's stop why is the janitor buying the bodies yeah 
sense. Um, he would use the deformed cadavers in his insurance frauds and experiment on them as well. I'm now, so I didn't find any um, any report stating like how he would um, experiment on them, but only that okay. he would experiment on them. So I don't know if he was trying to do like some kind of surgeries to like figure out like the human body or how he can be weird. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hope he's just ultimately like, medical experiments. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd hate to think what else that could mean. Yeah. No, I, you know, this We're not man gonna go there. had a very lengthy record. And uh, he has an amazing mustache, by the way. If you haven't oh seen God. what he looks like, look up H.H. H. Holmes. He's great. Look at that mustache. It's, it's great. He was handsome, but also not attractive, if that makes sense. Um, best friend Sarah, you know the type. Uh, we both know the type. We are attracted to the same type. <laughs> so me and you could have possibly been one of his victims. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Could you imagine? Oh, gosh. His first elaborate fraud was purchasing a corpse and using it in a life insurance claim in Rhode Island. Uh, he found a body that looked just like himself. He brought it to a hotel and then mutilated it. He then shaved his mustache. I wept when I, read, when I wrote that down. Like He shaved his mustache. And then when he left, um, he left after he shaved his mustache. But when he returned, red flag is my favorite color, same. Uh, but when he returned, he asked about his friend H.H. H. Holmes, and they went in to look, and he was found dead in the, in the room. Uh, he called the insurance company to collect the life insurance, but the insurance company was like, man, this is a little suspicious. And it didn't work out for him that time. So good for him. <laughs> it's such a weird thing to do. Oh, I found a body that looks like just like me. So I'm gonna Yeah. I'm and gonna it's pretend I'm dead. It's not the first time that he does this. Uh it's not the only time that he does this. He he ends up trying to do it later on too. Uh but it also doesn't work out. So good for him. He tried. <laughs> I applaud him. I you know, I don't know if I'm gonna applaud There uh, there was an attempt. Fraud. You know? I mean, yeah, good, good effort, I guess. <laughs> oh, my God. It, he just keeps getting weirder. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so in the summer of his junior year, he got a job as a traveling salesman and decided to keep the money instead of paying off his debts. Uh, he then moved to Chicago in 1885 and worked for ABC Copier Company until 50 gallons of glycerin had disappeared along with himself. Now... How the hell does 50 gallons of glycerin disappear? Right, because that's like a, a, that's a big barrel of glycerin. Yeah, it's and a that's, lot. What, what did he use it for? Uh, you know, I was trying to find that information, but I could not. So what is usually, like, what is glycerin usually used for, right? So, like. Um, I know it's on. one of the base products in, like nitroglycerin which is used in TNT I think it's like a lubricant almost I think heart medication oh wait glycerin is a common ingredient in pharmaceutical drugs including heart medication suppositories cough rem remedies and anesthetics oh oh anesthetics so Putting, he might have used it to put some people to sleep when they came to the murder castle, which we'll get to. That's uh, uh, that makes more sense. That makes more sense. And I have to tell you, most of my research did not come from the internet. Like, it came from other podcasts. So really? I listen to um, True Crime all the time. Um, Mike and Gibby, they're pretty great. They were talking about H.H. H. Holmes. And I got all of my information from them and, and like another podcast. I can't remember which one it was because I listened to so many. Yeah. And they were like, what the hell do you use that for? <laughs> I don't remember which one said that, but one of them said the same thing. And I don't, they, I don't think they ever gave us an answer. It's I, wild. Right. And that's a lot of glycerin. That's not a small amount. 
So he just disappears with 50 gallons of glycerin. Damn. Who'd have thunk it? Thunk it. Jesus. Um, he moved into a small town of Inglewood and worked at the town pharmacy under the alias of Dr. Henry H. Holmes. He convinced the owner to sell him the pharmacy, and shortly after the sale, the owner, Dr. Holton, died, and his wife suddenly moved to California, but many suspect that Holmes killed both of them to gain control of the pharmacy, which... I mean, it wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility, right? Yeah. It's um, killed for a lot less. Yeah, a lot less. Uh, Holmes would attend the World Fair in... Uh, I don't have a date. Well, shit. Uh, so what is that? Hold 18, on. 1886? Yeah. That makes sense to me. Um, he met Murda Belknap. So they dated for a few months, and then he married Murda. Um, he bought a plot of land across the street from the pharmacy, and he would build what we know as the murder castle, but they call it a hotel. So the bottom layer, I'll get into what it looks like. That's, it's a whole thing. I have like a whole section. It's just, it's so much. Go for it. Oh my God. Um... So during the construction of the hotel, Holmes would periodically fire the workers and hire a new one so they wouldn't understand how... Uh, what's up, Renee? Uh, so they wouldn't understand, like, how the building works because there's so many, like, moving parts to it. Um, he would also refuse to pay them once he fired them. <laughs> you know, I'm noticing a, a trend here. Yeah. He just, uh, he doesn't like to pay people. No, not at all. Um... <laughs> In the summer of 88, 1888, uh, Murda became pregnant and she moved back in with her parents. And shortly after, Murda and Holmes stopped talking. Like the communication just stopped. Uh, she gave birth to a baby girl named Lucy Theodate Holmes, which I love that so much. Um, Lucy actually grew up to become a school teacher. So I thought that was pretty cool. So she grew up normal. All right. Yeah. Uh, construction of the hotel was complete in 1892 and was open for business. The first floor was a bunch of shops. Um, so you have like the pharmacy and the, the butchers and all that stuff. Um, the top floors uh, had the living quarters and uh, there was smaller rooms. <laughs> I have a typo in here. Did you read that? <laughs> <laughs> smaller rumors. <laughs> smaller rumors. <laughs> Smooth. You know, I, I'm, I'm more of a big rumor kind of guy. Yeah, you know, same. Uh, so they had many small rooms where he would torture and kill many of his victims. Uh, there were trap doors and chutes that led to the basement where he had a giant kiln, uh, quicklime pits, acid bats, and dissection lab. Uh, the second floor had 51 doors, six hallways, 35 rooms, and some were regular bedrooms, but others were either airtight and lined with asbestos-coated steel plates or completely so, uh, soundproof. So that was... Yeah. Yeah. And this is not your... Now, everyone, understand, this is not your typical hotel layout. He's purposefully made this layout in a way that only he understands so that, like... Even if you got out of a room and you got away from him, you could not get outside because you have nowhere where the hallways go. Or, uh, does this door go in here? I mean, you could fall to the basement. It's like this is the thing of nightmares. Yeah. Uh, some rooms were small with low ceilings, no bigger than closets. Hello, Hotel Cortez. Is that you? Oh, my God. <laughs> Bestie Sarah is so good with this. Um, some... Some rooms were small with low ceilings, no bigger than closets. Most rooms were uh, rigged with the gas pipes connected to a control panel in Holmes's closet that he equipped with peepholes so he could watch because he's sick. Grody. Uh, some rooms had gas pipes with cutoff valves, but some of the valves were fake. Um, so it was believed that the asbestos lined chamber, Holmes added the element of fire. So that the gas pipes would become a blowtorch. 
Yeah, that's it's a lot. So you had the the room with the fake valves. They thought that that might have been the asbestos lined rooms. This is tough. These floors also had uh, were set with alarms. If anyone went around looking, he'd be alerted in his secret office room. What? Yep. I didn't know about the office room. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it was also said that in his office, so like he had a whole, I believe they said he had a whole like floor to himself mm -hmm. so that his room would be connected to a chute that would go into the basement so that he it would easy it would be easier for him to carry these bodies from the upstairs without people seeing in the first floor. It's wild. But, uh, Holmes used the World's Fair to uh, market the building as a hotel and bring more potential victims. And if they couldn't pay, he would forgive their debts and they would disappear, leaving their belongings behind. And he would tell people they went out of town. Now, let me ask you guys something. In what world would a woman leave all of her belongings behind to leave town? Right, like how many times did he use this excuse and did people really believe him? You know what? I... I... It feels uh, like the, the first time, you'd be like, oh, that's kind of weird. The second, third, fourth, fifth time, pe somebody should have said, now, wait a minute. There's an awful lot of people just leaving their stuff. Yeah, it's, it's wild. So um, I was listening to the True Crime All the Time podcast, right, as one does. And they mentioned this next little blurb that I have. Um, in March of 1893, the Chicago Tribune published an article about Holmes, stating he did not pay for hundreds of dollars worth of furniture he bought on credit for his hotel. After the article was published, angry merchants showed up trying to get their furniture back, but there were only empty rooms. One furniture shop said they paid somebody to watch the hotel, and once they saw furniture come in, they would send people in to collect their furniture. Um, they once bribed a man, $25, that worked there, to help him find the furniture. Uh, Holmes had hidden all the furniture in a secret room, then took out the door frame, blocked up the room with bricks, and then covered it with wallpaper. Pretty extensive. Uh, $25. So, $25 in... Hold on, I'm trying to figure out... The conversion out. from 1886 to now? Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. In a CD hotel, oh, oh. you'd be surprised how little attention people pay. Yeah. So $25 back then is equivalent to $824 and change today. So Not he, bad. So they, he paid, made they paid a guy some pretty good money. Yeah. Uh, eventually, they would get their, uh, their furniture back um, after all of this. So good for them. Uh, there were so many frauds. I'm surprised he could keep track of them all, honestly. Like, it, it, too many between yeah, like, the furniture and then the, the, the hotel, the insurance yeah, his, fraud. He had frauds inside of his frauds. Yeah, I don't know how, like, because I can't lie and then keep up with my lie. Like, I, I suck right. at lying. So it's just like, how does he keep up? Ugh, these people are wild. I don't understand. Um, it was said that one of his inventions, so he liked to invent things, right? So like one of his inventions, uh, was a machine that could turn water into gas. Now get this shit, right? So it was a big bowl that was, uh, that would sit on top of stilts and it had a fire on top and wire and pipes flowing from the top. Um, and then what he did was he instead like tapped into the city's gas line. And use the city's gas. So one guy, um, one guy sat in the room because he was so intrigued and uh, um, by this invention that somebody sent this man to sit in this room and watch how it worked. So he sat there and he was so amazed and he was like, "I don't understand." And it would power the entire building. And so uh, it was said that later on, like a couple of companies bought this particular invention for like eight hundred dollars or whatever, which was. If twenty five dollars in eighteen hundreds oh equates to about eighteen or eight hundred dollars our time now, that's 
that's pretty bananas. I, I'll, I'll find it. <laughs> I'm just going to go a nice even round 800 because I don't have that note in here. That's the equivalent of over $26,000. Okay, so he allegedly sold this invention to, for 26000 our money. Um, yeah, so the city eventually found out about this, and he was charged $0.10 cents for the gas stolen um, for, like, I guess, like every ounce or gallon or whatever. I don't know. I didn't find the equivalent, the equation for that one. So, uh, I'm at a loss on that one. Uh, but they dug the machine out of the basement and they left a large hole in its place. And instead of getting upset at this large hole, Holmes said, you know what? Let's market this. He said, y'all want some natural spring soda that just so good. It's so good for you. Just makes you so so smooth. Um, yeah. It, he, filled, he filled it with soda water and uh, he was selling the natural soda water from a natural spring. Natural Scientist. Soda. Yeah, so, so, yeah, natural. So it was good for you, water. You know, personally, I'm a natural Sprite spring kind of guy. Like, I, if something's <laughs> going to come out the ground, I want it to be like Sprite or something like that. Exactly. Yeah, scientists caught on to that, and he was, they were like, mm -mm -mm. no, it's he not. Was, I, I like how you put it, he was soon called out by local chemists. Like, yeah, like, yeah, so, like, no. yeah, so they, the chemists and the scientists and all them, they came together, and they were like, uh, so this is actually the water from the Chicago River over here. Just, he tried it. He tried so many things. Jesus. So this part I thought was interesting. Um, in 1893, Julie, uh, Julia Connor, her husband Ned, and their 12-year-old daughter Pearl moved to Chicago from Iowa. Now this all is important, I promise. It sounds like it's not. <laughs> uh, I, I wait she... with bated breath. <laughs> Uh, she began an affair with Holmes, and she got pregnant. Uh, dear Ned, Ned, sweet baby Ned, found out and left her and Pearl to live with Holmes in the hotel. Uh, so Julia said, you know what? Uh, you need to marry me. She demanded it. She was like, Holmes, you need to marry me. I am pregnant. And he's like, nah, I don't want it. Uh, so he said... I'll marry you if you get an abortion, but I have one request. I have to do the abortion. Oh, no. Yeah. Yep. So he performed no. the surgery. She agreed to said surgery. Uh, sadly, she wouldn't make it. I wonder why. Yeah. It was worth a shot. Uh, he then proceeds to poison Pearl her 12-year-old daughter, with chloroform. And then he told everyone that they went back to Iowa because they didn't like it in Chicago. <laughs> there it is again. But, the, oh, but wait. There's so much. There's so much more. Like, he does this so many times. Um, oh, this... Uh, okay, so he... His business partner, Benjamin Peitzel, you'll hear about him a lot more in a little bit, uh, he told Holmes about this girl named Emmeline Seagrand. Um, she was thought to be his next victim, and she ended up becoming his personal secretary, and it was said that she might have known about many of his frauds. So, red flags. Already. Okay. Uh, so she was she was in on the frauds, but was she in on the murders? Did she know about the murders? Sure. You know? uh, we do not know. Uh, but I assume that she might have found something out because he later killed her. Um, and then so he... So she definitely knew about the murders at the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he, Holmes is setting out a whole hit 
on all these women. He has a he has like a pattern. Um, so he'll like marry a woman and then kill her. Except Clara. Clara was the exception. And um fuck, what is her name? Murda. So so far, Murda and Clara are safe. So far. So far. For is that foreshadowing? Now. We don't know. <laughs> um, so after he uh, murders this poor, sweet Emmeline, uh, he tells everybody, he, so he sets up a fake wedding plan, right? So he tells everybody, like, she's marrying this man named Robert Phelps. And he went so far as to making, like, fake wedding invitations and sending them out. And, uh, so he, he said he got one. He went, he was, he's so deep into it at this point. Like there's no coming back. Right. He has so many layers of lies that I, I mean, how, it makes you wonder like why anyone ever believed him. He must've been one hell of a good liar. Oh, yeah. He, uh, apparently, he was super charming, which, to do the things that he does, he has to be somewhat charming, yeah. right? So, that, that I, I would say then he's probably a psychopath, because, you know, psychopaths can be very charming and, and magnet, have magnetic personalities when they want to. So, he, he, yeah, he, he has to be really good at talking to people and convincing them to do the things he's done, yeah. uh, even up just to this point. There it is. Uh, Bestie Sarah. There it is. Yeah. Uh, so her, so Emmeline and her fake fiance uh, went missing. And then her remains were later found in a trunk. Like a clothes trunk. Like a travel trunk. Yeah. Because uh, this is before cars, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, I think actually. Mm. Cars were f pretty fairly new. Yeah, I think people were still trotting along with a little horse and carriage. <laughs> trotting along. <laughs> I was watching the, um, oh God, what the hell is it called? The H.H. H. Holmes documentary on Hulu. And I was mm. like, man, I'm falling asleep. This is kind of boring. And I was like watching it. And I'm like, oh my God, these people are giving me so much anxiety. Because there's like cars going one way and then horses and carriages going another way. And somebody's <laughs> standing in the middle of the road. It's chaos. It's utter chaos. And I'm like, no, I can't. No. <laughs> um, so a woman named Minnie Williams later answered an ad in a newspaper um, to be a typist for Holmes uh, Holmes fell in love with her right quote unquote uh, they get fell married in, in 1893 uh, he discovers that she is an heiress and had $50,000 worth of land in her name there it is there she goes. Uh, but there was a problem for him, though, uh, with this heiress situation. Uh, she had a sister named Annie, and she had first claim to the land. So naturally, he had to take her out, right? So Is he that... killed her. Yep. Killed her. And he's just stacking bodies like cordwood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So here's, here's how he did it, right? So he told Minnie, he's like, hey, write to your sister. Minnie goes... Okay. So Minnie writes to her sister and she's like, hey, come down to this mur uh, to murder castle. <laughs> come down to this hotel in Chicago. Uh, you know, we and him just got married. It's great. It's a beautiful time. Uh, come celebrate. So she was like, oh, okay, neat. Hops the train, comes over. Uh, Holmes decides, let's go pick her up. So they, he picked her up, brought her back to the hotel, and then she was never seen again. And then, to make matters worse, um, he took Minnie on a train trip, and he poisoned her, then buried her, and then later said he, uh, he regretted killing Minnie because he was the only one, or she was the only one that he loved. Like, he actually you loved know, her. Did he, though? That's a good did question. He, he regretted Because I feel like it. if you love someone, you, you just don't love someone, kill you're not going to kill them. Yeah, exactly. So, I was like, I, oh. I've heard, I've heard of loving somebody to death. 
but not like that. That's not what that means. It, no, yeah, no. I'm like, oh, when I was writing that down and reading everything and doing my research, I was like, oh, but he loved her. No, he didn't. But he did. That's so sweet. He loved, he loved money. Star-crossed way, lovers. That $50,000 is worth about one and a half million. So, Jesus. I mean, I get it. Hey, you know, million dollars, all you got to do is take out your your uh, your heiress's sister and kill her. I mean, pff, easy. Oh my Done. God. Right, exactly. Uh, soon after, he murders his love of his life. Sweet baby mini. Uh, he meets a woman named Georgiana Yoke. Now, we like Georgiana. Georgiana seems like a badass, right? Uh, it's possible the itch takes over like venom. Oh. Good. It's like yeah. a crime of passion. Yeah, it could be a, a compulsion to kill. Yeah. He has to. Interesting. Um, so him and Georgiana date for a while, and then they marry in January of 1894. Now, I don't know if you guys have been keeping up with these dates, but I want to start by saying that he has not once sent divorce papers. He's still technically married Don't to all the other ones. Uh, apparently, um, allegedly, he got divorce papers and sent them out. But Clara was like, I don't know what he's talking about. I never got divorce papers. I never seen them. So, <laughs> yep. Smooth nice. move, X-Lax. Nice. Yeah, he's getting married a lot. And just in the year, like, 1893, he's had, like, two or three wives. Yeah, it's a wild. They killed him. Eight, from 1893 to... What was it? Hold on. The, you know, the who, whoever's officiating his weddings probably has given him a punch card. And it's like, hey, listen, get five weddings, get the second one, uh, get the sixth one half off. Exactly. So, from 1878 to... 1893 or 1894 we're on his fourth wife and who knows how many mistresses sure yeah. everybody had a mistress back then oh yeah you were nobody no. if you didn't have one yeah your, your wife is two states over there's no phone calls oh. so can't just drop by so there's no facebook can't just check on things yeah so he was arrested for insurance fraud soon after um, the marriage, but then he was released. Uh, here's where Peitzel comes back in. Uh, so Holmes and Peitzel produced a plan to fake Peitzel's death for $10,000. All right, what is $10,000 in today's money? <laughs> While you're looking that up. Uh, <laughs> They would travel to Colorado, Missouri, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Texas, where they committed other acts of insurance fraud and a horse theft. Uh, it's about 330000 Okay, so you're going to fake Peitzel's death for $380,000 in today's money. Good, good, good. Jesus. Uh, so I love that it says insurance fraud in all these states, but then a horse theft. That's my favorite part. I just stole a horse. Yeah, yeah store. Yep. Uh, he returned to Missouri and was arrested again for fraud. Now, while he was in jail, at this point, he, uh, he met somebody named Marion Hedgepeth. It was his, um, his cellmate. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with Marion Hedgepeth, but he was a career criminal. Uh, but he knew H.H. H. Holmes as H.M. Howard. Grand Theft Horse. Grand Theft Horse. <laughs> um, so he uh, agreed to help Holmes in the insurance fraud with Peitzel. I don't know how. Because like Marion it. decided he was going to stay in jail. Decided like he was, it was his choice. That's, that's what I'm going with. Um, so he's helping Homeboy with the fraud. And Peitzel. So I'm assuming he's giving him some kind of information to help. Um, so Holmes was released, but again, uh, he discovered that Peitzel had moved to PA. 
So Peitzel said, fuck this guy. I'm going to Pennsylvania. Deuces. <laughs> uh, cool. He opened up a... So Peitzel is smart, right? Peitzel moved. Fuck you, Holmes. I got to get... I got to make more money. So Peitzel goes to PA and he opens up a fake patent office so that he can swindle potential investors. So he's taking all these people's money for these patents that they're... I'm like, this man, these, these schemes, how do they come up with them? I'm not smart enough. I don't have a criminal brain. I don't know how this one... They, they just, they're doing the most. Um, so Peitzel took out an insurance policy on himself and together with Holmes, now that Holmes is in PA... Uh, they plan to fake his death. But Holmes said, joke's on you. I'm going to actually kill you. Yep. No, you're not. Uh, so, gotcha, gotcha, bitch. Uh, Peitzel's body was found burned with chloroform in his stomach in a house in Pennsylvania. So there appeared to have been an explosion that released deadly chemicals uh, so police, when they went there to investigate, they were like, oh, accident. Uh, but something was a little fishy because the way that his body was set up was not accidental. Um, so that's fun. Uh, next to his body, police found a broken bottle and a pipe. And given the evidence, they thought it was an accidental death, like I just said. Uh, the mm -hmm. home was owned by a man named B.F. Perry, who was Benjamin Peitzel. And uh, it was later learned that Holmes tied Peitzel up, poured benzene on him, and set him on fire. Oh, he burned him alive? Yarp. I didn't know that part. Yeah. Ooh, that's brutal. Yeah. That's a really callous way to kill somebody. I mean, I guess killing somebody is pretty callous, but... Right. <laughs> of, all, of all the ways you can do it, lighting somebody on fire is pretty messed up. Oh. Um, so, Holmes then went to Peitzel's wife and mm. explained to her that, hey, you know, Ben's still alive, but he's on the run. Uh, so, he convinced her, like, he said, hey, you know, Ben's alive, he's on the run, uh, can, let me take three of your five children so that I can go, uh, you know, what? we can go visit. She was like, all right, cool. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, so, y'all, this is where it gets rough. So, I understand if you, like, the other stuff is rough, don't get me wrong, but this here is the roughest shit I have had to write or listen to. I am concerned. It's very, very sad. So I understand if this is not your journey, turn back now. Um, they would become his final victims. Uh, uh, the eight-year-old Howard um, was killed by dismemberment and burning the pieces and stuffing them into a chimney in Indiana. Uh, he took Alice and Nellie to Canada. Um, they would write letters to their mother so she knew where to find them later on uh, to mm -hmm. come visit. But Holmes never sent the letters out. Uh, but what he did do was he made his luggage trunk into a makeshift gaf gas chamber while on the run. Um, and on October 5th of 1894, Alice and Nellie were put into the trunks and gassed. They're... This part's so sad. So their naked bodies were found shortly after. Um, there were no reports of essays. So that's helpful in some way. But I think at this point, I just hope it went quick for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... Yeah, I think I cried a little bit when I was writing this up. I was like, oh, not the babies. I know, and he, he, he killed them in different places. That's... Yeah. Yeah, it's rough. Did, 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 did the other two not go, oh, where's... You know, it's kind of like, 
Huey, Louie, and Dewey in DuckTales. Yeah. And like, hey, where's Louie? I don't know. Oh, gosh. God. It's so but awful. It's his final victims, though, so. Yeah. Uh, in November of 1894, he was finally apprehended, uh, apprehended and sent to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's like a hop, skip, and a jump away from me. Would y'all look <laughs> at that? Uh, where he was tried for the murder of Benjamin Peitzel. Uh, yes, just Benjamin Peitzel. Uh, he admitted to killing 27, but that number increased to about 130, but it was thought to be 200 or more um, that he actually murdered. Um, uh, he sold his story to the Hearst Corporation for $10,000. Uh, Jesus. Um, he was convicted in 1895 where he appealed his case but lost. A uh, duh. Why does he think... He can appeal this case. 130 people. Did they ever did they ever find the remains? Or was the fact that they had like acid baths and lie pits? I think uh, like, that was a big thing. Was When they went to go search, they ultimately found the pits and the, the kiln. And then they did find, um, apparently they found Minnie's watch in the burn pit, like the kiln. Um, they found pieces of fabric belonging to uh, somebody's dress. Um, they found bones, obviously. Um, just like a bunch of random stuff that belonged to all these victims. Could you imagine if this... Is this place... Did it get torn down or does it still exist? It seems like if it still existed, it'd be... I haunted. thought I put something in here about this. Hold on. Um, because I, but I feel like if this place was still standing, it'd become a huge, like, tourist attraction. So I think I read somewhere, oh, it burned down. Okay. Cause I was burned. like, I okay. couldn't remember if it burned down or if it was torn down. Um, probably, probably for the best. Burned yeah. It to the ground. Um, on May 7th of 1896, he was hanged for the murder of Benjamin Peitzel. Uh, he was, this was a fun one because I pulled up an article. I, I've had this article up on my phone for months trying to figure out like who, like what different information I could find. Um, so I'm on WHYY on their website. Uh, and it says, Penn scientists dig up evidence to settle questions about H.H. H. Holmes' first American serial killer. Uh, so basically, let's see, what year was, when did this article come out? Uh, 2017. So take this with the grain of salt. Um, uh, let's see. So he was buried in concrete below the water table at his own request, according to an article posted by WHYY, which I was about to read, um, but I did see that I quoted some of this stuff. Uh, Due to the anaerobic environment inside the chamber of water-filled concrete, gross, his body, this is even grosser, his body had not properly decomposed um, after 120 years or so. Um, and it was just perfectly preserved clothes and his skull with his mustache still attached, but all the body tissue was a puddle that had to be pumped out. They turned into pudding. <laughs> Ew! Uh. Okay, now I can't eat pudding. Um, so basically, he... Oh, God. Uh, somebody, one of the scientists... Uh, fuck, what was this person's name? Uh, Cox, Samantha Cox. So Samantha Cox said it stank. Once it gets to that point, we can't do anything with it. We can't test it, can't get any DNA out of it. It's really kind of sludge. Oof. It's so disgusting. I know. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to imagine the smell. I'm okay. I think the funnier the the funnier picture is is he has his skull and his mustache is still attached to it. Like, so now let's get into some of the, the conspiracy theories here. 
So one conspiracy was that he actually paid somebody to pretend to bury his body, but in fact he was out roaming the streets and became the uh, Jack the Ripper. But also um, the Black Dahlia murderer. Now, I have to tell you that when I read the Black Dahlia murder, um, my brain instantly went, the math ain't mathin'. How could that be possible? Because the 1800s in the 1900s, and I said, there's no way, and I calculated it, and I said, there's no way that an, I think it was an 86-year-old man would be roaming the streets murdering random people. It's possible. Like, Elizabeth Short was murdered by a doctor. I am convinced of this. So it does make sense. Could but be. he would have needed help. You know, maybe he had an excellent exercise regime, and he just... You're right. He's a pretty virile 86-year-old. You're right. So what are your, what are your thoughts on... Um, the Jack the Ripper thing, because I know that there's other conspiracy theories uh, that we actually talked about on a previous stream uh, about Queen Victoria's grandson was allegedly could have been uh, Jack the Ripper as well. Yeah, I think it's I think it's an interesting theory that he was Jack the Ripper, but I, I Holmes to me seems like a very very um precise individual very calculated in how he murdered people he probably dissected them and tormented them whereas jack the ripper while they do think he probably had some medical background much more like vicious in my mind yeah oh yeah 100 percent. i think it's it's wild to think about just yeah. the fact that some psycho is running the streets uh just murdering people it's wild like i can't get into the mind of a serial killer i've tried um now unpopular opinion i did try to get uh, i was watching Dahmer, right uh we all love evan peters um so i was watching Dahmer, and i did kind of understand where he was coming from with some of his but at the same time it's like that's still like sick and twisted like i don't mm -hmm. know how to explain what my brain was doing when like with with him without feeling like a serial killer you know because it's like it, yeah it's a it, it's a weird ugh. place to have to try and put yourself and I, I i think it's impossible for a lot of for the majority of the population because the majority of the population could not fathom like killing somebody for any other reason besides like self-defense yeah. you know because it it it's a very unnatural act, I think. Um, so, yeah. I think... In interesting guy. The mind of a serial killer is interesting to me. Because a lot of times you, you hear that they, like, had a head injury. Or they were massively abused as a child. But this kid had a pretty normal childhood. And he turned yeah. into... This. I mean, aside from his disciplinary father putting him in the in the attic. Yeah, I I I, I think serial killers their their brains are just wired differently. Like some of them get pleasure out of uh, killing people or torturing them. Some of them, uh, it's like a, a cleansing act. Like they feel like they're doing something good for the world. Uh, or in other ones, they just, they want that power. Maybe they feel powerless in their daily lives. And, um, that, that's how they, they take it out. Because you, you see a lot in uh, just studying all of these different serial killers throughout history. Like, there's always some sort of, like, mental trauma or some of them are just sociopaths. Like, they, they can't empathize with people and they don't connect with them. And so it's it's almost nothing to them to to do what they do. So yeah, it's rough. Yeah, it's tough, and we'll we'll definitely get into a lot more fucked up serial killers. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have to start putting uh, 
discretionary warnings on our shit. Yep. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the one I want to do is the BTK, BTK killer. killer <laughs> and uh, just a little snippet because I was listening. I think I think it was the BD, BTK killer. But like anytime he was about to do like something where he's going to kill someone or stalk him, he'd call it like going dark. And a yeah. lot of psych psychologists say that like that's that's like the mental separation he had to give himself to justify what he was doing because he wasn't like going dark. Um, you know, he's he's separated himself out. So I, 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 interesting. And yeah. I think he did have a, a pretty messed up childhood. Oh, yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go through my list and see what I want to do next. I, I so think he was one of the I, he's one of the serial killers who like targeted women because he had like some weird upbringing with his mom and like took it out on people. I think. Don't quote me on that. Oh yeah, no, I remember hearing a podcast about dear old Dennis Rader mm -hmm. and his mommy. I, I, I work with a guy whose name is Brennan Raider. So when I saw Raider, I actually texted him. I was like, hey, are you related to this serial killer? He goes, what? No. Oh. I was like, all right, just checking. I was watching a TikTok the other day, as I do very religiously. Um, and there was this girl who was talking about how she went to a restaurant. And mm -hmm. her waitress, her wa her waiter, uh, apparently was super hot, and his last name was Bundy. And she said, "Oh, like Ted Bundy?" And he goes, "Yeah." <laughs> you can probably hear a lot. I'm actually related to him. And she goes, "Oh, what? Are you oh. serious?" So what? you know, we have uh, dear old Ted Bundy's family running around and. That's how they're associated. Poor, poor Bundy family. Like, it's wild to think. Yeah. You know, you really don't think about that. Like, these are actual people who had, like, friends and relatives. Like, they, they probably, somebody knew them. And they're out there. Yeah, and I, thought. I don't want like a, a victim's family mm -hmm. to look at any podcast or watch any documentary or film or anything that has to do with these these murders and think oh that's how we're thought of so uh, yeah it's a hit or miss honestly like when Dahmer came out everybody was like up in arms about it because they didn't reach out to the families they didn't get permissions, so eventually I would love to get, you know, some kind of permission of sorts or their side of the story or something. Oh sure, but yeah, that might take yeah. a while. And, and I, I, and I don't want people to look at like podcasts like this or documentaries like you're idolizing these 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 monsters because they are monsters. Um. It's it's more an interesting dive into like how messed up the world is and just trying to like bring awareness to these topics because learning about these topics could potentially save your life. You, you know, kind of put you put you on alert for some of these behaviors and more importantly, it's a study of, of humanity basically you know, what makes us us and what you know the very fine line between what we consider normality and abnormality and how quickly that can shift and change people's lives forever, you know? Exactly. It's like um, I watch Killer Queens or I listen to Killer Queens podcast and they call it Diet True Crime where, um, what does she say? Um, we are something about the, I don't know, I lost it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my phone. The all of the crime, all of the true crime with fewer calories or something like that. It's something really cute in the 90s. So, I would like to think of us as diet true crime now. You know. Sure. We'll yeah. So we put, we put all of our information in and then we put our sassy selves in, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. So that was Holmes, y'all. That, that, that was it. That was, that was the 
H Cube, the H H Holmes. Yes. Uh, AKA the Murder Castle, AKA the Mustache, AKA the Mustache. The mustache. That's right. When when's the next when's the next podcast gonna be? When, yeah, I guess it all revolves around me actually getting my shit together, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I still have to write my next thing. I have to figure out what I'm doing. I have so many ideas. I just don't know what I want to go with. I think I'm diving into Robert Wohn. Uh I would love to... I sent you something on Discord. I got some stuff getting right happened behind me. right? But um, there was Brian Pennell or Pennell. Um, and he was... Delaware's first serial killer, also known as the Route 40 killer. So he might be fun to dive into. Um, okay. But then there was also um, this thing in Oklahoma where four friends went missing recently. It was actually, uh, when did I send this to you? October 17th is when I sent this to you. Um, the four friends went missing and mm -hmm. then they were found dismembered in the Oklahoma River. So that might be fun to dig into as well. Um, because there's a lot of mystery. But then we can also do a conspiracy theory. Um, Bestie Sarah, I know that so badly we want to talk about... Um, about Aaron Carter and that whole fiasco... Uh, once we have more information, we will definitely talk about it. For sure. So, because something ain't right. But it don't add up. Yeah, the math ain't mathin', and I'm going to need to math. Nope, I'm going to need the math to start mathing. Yes, that one. So If it, if it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's, it's definitely not a dog. Yeah, exactly. So, some weird things. And then we can talk about Kurt Cobain and how that was fucking oh weird. God. Is there a conspiracy behind that? There, oh. I was under the impression that he, you know. Unalived his, himself? Yeah, he took his favorite Oh, and, no. Oh, no. There's so much into that one. My God. I'd be interested in that. So... Bestie Sarah has been messaging the whole time. I have not been ignoring you. Um, hold, please. They're like carrying in groceries. Cool. Um, okay, so Bestie Sarah has been saying, uh, who is out here honoring the last dying wishes of a serial killer? Uh, the answer to that is somebody who likes money. If they're paying right, you know. Um... Let's see. Uh, it is a whole different brain, a whole new chemistry like logic doesn't logic for mm -hmm. them. Logic doesn't logic right. for them. Got it. Um, and then she said podcast time. Like, and will our podcast be your time, Colorado time? Be any time. It could be any, any time. But these will be, um, these will be taken and put onto YouTube and I'm going to start putting I'm going to try to figure out how to put it on Spotify because I'm kind of not smartical with that so um, I, there, there's some different services you can use hosting services basically so okay yeah we'll, we'll take figure a sneak peek into that we'll get it going yeah and it'll get better and smoother Yes, and I, I won't I stumble think, on my words. One, I thought this was this one was interesting. Yes, this was fun. Not the case, but doing. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Murders. <fun. laughs> oh my god! Like, okay, Bundy, chill. <laughs> like the, like that stupid, uh, goofy cartoon where <laughs> Goofy's on trial for murder. Oh my god. Uh, the people out there who know it, know it. I call kangaroo court, y'all. Oh, jeez. Right, so that's, that's, that's the podcast. That's the thing. 
we, we did the thing. Thanks for tuning in to No F and Clue, because we have no F and Clue. Hey, that's, um, that's make sure mildly. make sure y'all keep uh, your your uh, head on a swivel. Now I feel Lock like I'm doors. copywriting because that is definitely a uh, true crime all the time. Um, so make sure you know your surroundings. Be weary. And, and always it, check your back fucking seat. Always. <laughs> and if your gut says something's wrong, it's probably wrong. Exactly. Yes. All right. Thank you, Voodoo. Bye, guys. Bye.